The only thing with the hot glue is you have to be sure it is on very, very thin. Um, I always tell everybody, put the hot glue gun, the tip of it right down on the acrylic and, you know, make your little circles or whatever. Because if it's too thick, it's going to raise your template up off your fabric too much. And then you're going to have a whole nother problem. So these are little grip dots. I actually have them manufactured for this reason. Um, they're very thin in comparison to most grip dots. And they're also smaller than most grip dots. Um, so even when I'm using the smaller templates, they fit in these littler places where the half inch ones or three quarter inch ones don't necessarily fit very well. Okay. Um, so you're going to want to put enough grip dots on. People always ask me, well, just one in each corner. You need to put enough on there that you feel confident that this template isn't going to slide on your fabric. Because if the template slides on your fabric, well, you've just defeated the whole purpose of using a template. Okay? So, um, really make sure there's enough on there. I usually say six, seven, usually is about where I am um, on them. If it's a real tiny one, maybe four. But generally speaking, six, six is usually probably about my go-to amount of grip dots. So you just want them on there any old place. And it doesn't really matter which way you put them on, which side. The only thing that I can tell you is if you can read the name of the template, like this one says clouds, well, I put them on the opposite side of that because that way I can read what it for, you know, whatever the template's called. Um, the templates are named because we do have an extensive YouTube channel. And you can go to the YouTube channel and type in clouds and get um, all the videos that have clouds in them will pop up. So you don't have to look through 125 or 150 videos to find one that has the clouds in it. Okay, so that's that. Let's see what else is on our list. Um, thread. You can use any kind of thread that you want. Um, depending on what kind of thread that I'm using, uh, G actually, my partner in crime, you know, G, she, she's got me hooked on the uh, thread director now. And so typically speaking, I'm using the thread director um, because my thread will come off correctly and I get a lot less breakage of my thread. Um, especially down the needle. And with the thread director, I'm able to, if I want to run two two threads at once through the same needle, I can do that. Also metallics, any of those things like that, I can run those threads now without breaking. So um, I use the thread director for that, but I'm using, I think I've got, uh, I use a lot of superior thread, um, but I use, um, like this is Mettler, I think which is fine. You can use 100% cotton, poly, rayon, whatever kind of thread you like. Um, but, you know, this particular one is cotton. So that's what I'm using today. Um, lube. Somewhere, somebody brought me some lube, but never gave it to me. So, well, I have the little bottle. It's Steph's Thread Lube. And uh, Dave got it for me, but I think he took it back out. Anyways, regardless, it's in a little bottle this big. I love the fact that everything is my fault. Hey, you did have it. You, you sure did? he didn't handle it to you? Yeah, I'm positive. I probably took it back out, but that's not the point. <laughs> I get blamed for everything. But you do everything. Well, I understand that, but it gets tired of being blamed. Dave. Somebody's got it. Somebody's got to be blamed. It's, it's Mr. Dick to you. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so I have a little bottle of Thread Loop, which is just uh, liquid silicone. It's clear, um, but I run four or five, you know, little paths across my thread. So I'll just spin my thread, run a little line, spin my thread, run a little line. But it just lubricates it too. So that helps if you're having a thread breakage issue as well. So let's see. Top tension. When you begin quilting, especially if you've never done it before 
Or if you've done it and said, oh my gosh, I'm never doing that again because my tension looks like railroad tracks on the back and it's just awful and you throw that project in the garbage or you spend hours tearing it all out. Um, I usually suggest actually using two different colors of thread. So something completely different than what's on the top. So black in the back and pink on the top or whatever so that I can see what my tension is doing. So whether or not, you know, if I've got thread from the bobbin pulling up to the top, I know that I need it, you know, I need to loosen my tension or tighten my tension. Um, so I do that and I always test my tension prior to starting a project. Um, so when you test it, you want to test it with the exact same thread that you're going to use. You're going to want to test it with the exact same quilt, the fabric. So if it's cotton, you want to make sure that you're using cotton front, cotton back, just like your quilt's going to be. Same exact batting that you're going to use, okay? Because all of those things factor into your tension, all right? Um, the other thing is when you are going to start quilting, but when you're figuring out your tension, you're going to want to always bring your bobbin thread up to the top, okay? So that pops my bobbin up. And now all I'm going to do is I stitch in circles, okay? Because you're always going to see figure eight, something like this, because you're always going to see if you have tension issues, if you're doing it in circles. All right, so I don't see anything, but I see lots of pink going to the back, okay? So I'm gonna turn my top tension and I'm gonna stitch this again and see what it looks like. That's better. I don't have near as big, but I'm still gonna go a little bit further. I can still see some little tiny pink right here. Not a lot, not as much as I was here, having here. See how those stitches are kind of laying on top of the fabric? They aren't like sucked down in and making real nice stitches. So I'm gonna just tighten that up just a little bit more and I'm gonna try and see what happens. Looks pretty good, not too shabby. All right, so that's the third one. So one, two, and three. Now to avoid these nests, you wanna make sure you pull the bobbin thread up to the top, which I didn't hear in here, but you'll be able to do that when you're doing your quilt. So, okay, wonderful. So anybody have any questions before we go any further? Okay. Nobody's talking? To talk, they have to hit the microphone button. And if they don't have any questions, they're not doing it. Oh. Hey. I, had my, I, had, I had my mic um, muted because that's what y'all told us to do. Um, I have been practicing for about three years now. And I have been doing this since 'm scared to do that. It's scary. And I mean, if your mom was anything like my mom, I mean, my mother told me she'd break my arm. I'll break your arm if you touch that tension. May I, may I make a suggestion? You don't have to yell. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, what you can do is you can buy a separate bobbin case for your machine, and you can play with that one all you want and never touch the original one, the screw on your original one. So then you have a, a case that you can... Go ahead. I have it to know me. Um, I have it to know me sewing machine. And it, uh, there's a bobbin that I have. It's called a blue dot. And it's supposed to be used for free motion quilting. So I'm wondering, should I turn the screw on that one? Because I'm okay with turning the screw on that one. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I very seldom used it. Yeah, sure. Okay, Absolutely. So 
it is frustrating and and generally speaking you know we spend a lot of time making our quilts and table runners or whatever we're making we spend a lot of time doing it and we don't want it to be ruined and i felt this way for years that oh great now i finished this now i have to quilt it so that it's officially wrecked in my opinion because I was never satisfied with what my quilting looked like. And I always went back to stitching in the ditch, you know, because that was safe. Well, it's hard to stitch in the ditch and stitch in the ditch well. It's real hard. Yeah. So... Yeah, well, I've never, I didn't, I was unaware that Janome made a special bobbin for free motion quilting, which if you've got it, I think it's wonderful. Um, yeah, pull it out and you may not have to adjust it because it may already be done for you. Um, okay. It, Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah. It might not be a blue bobbin for your machine, though. Just an extra bobbin case will do. Yeah, I know. I mean, the bobbin case. The blue dot bobbin case. It has a blue dot instead of a red dot. Yeah, I personally don't know because I don't sew on a Janome at all. Oh, yeah. Sorry. It's good to know for me too. At least I have something to tell, something new to tell people because I was unaware. Yeah, was that about forty dollars? I think. Do you remember? Um, it wasn't cheap. I think it was thirty something. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, so, yeah. If you want to get another bobbin case, you know that's totally up to you. My so I don't I don't I have one Janome, but I, I haven't used it in a hundred years, and I'm generally sewing on a Juki is what I'm sewing on now. So, you know there isn't a different bobbin case. So I just took a took my thing apart and loosened my screw and it made a huge difference um, as far as that goes. And and maybe that's all the difference is between the blue dot and the red dot, who knows? Um, but it is something that people are generally scared to monkey with um, and understandably so. But if you're planning on doing a lot of quilting, it's worth the investment, I would say. So, Speed control is another, you're welcome. Speed control is another really, really big issue. If you're getting stitches that are really long or really short, or they're just all over the place, um, that all comes back to speed control. And you know, it's like rubbing your belly and tapping your head at the same time. And it's very, it's nearly impossible to do um, because your brain has a hard time doing more than one thing at a time. And so because of that, we end up, you know, moving our hands too fast or we've got the foot pedal pushed down too hard or whatnot. So what I've found, um, 
and this is not without having a whole bunch of long ugly stitches or stitches that were just tacked in on top of each other because I wasn't moving my hands fast enough um, is most of our machines nowadays have a slide speed control you know so you can you can set it down at the turtle or you can have it go and clear up on the bunny rabbit and you know anywhere in between so what I've found in teaching this and teaching it at shows in particular because at a show a lot of times you're on you know the whole classroom has you know say a Janome 11,000 or something and this is the classroom machine well maybe only two people in the whole classroom have a Janome 11,000 so the rest of us are all out of you know sorts because we don't have that sewing machine so it needs to be something that's fairly universal so that when you're talking about it, that, you know, it's, it's the same from one machine to another machine. And what I found works really well is if you set your speed control, so about three quarters of the way up, so about three quarters of the way to the bunny rabbit, um, because you really do want to be moving quite fast. The other thing is once you set that speed up higher, um, I don't ever suggest that people use the push button. You know, a lot of people will just use the push button to do their sewing and, you know, the push it to go, stop, push it to stop. Well, when you're move, when you have both hands on the fabric, driving the fabric, stopping isn't really a very good option because you're going to put a bunch of stitches right on top of each other. Okay. So I suggest always using your foot pedal. But when we use our foot pedal, normally this is what we're doing. Our heel is down here at the base and our toes are up here on the high part of the pedal. And when we do this, we go faster or slower like the gas pedal in our car, okay? Well, that's a problem because we can't ever find the same exact spot two or three times in a row, that's not gonna happen. But if you turn your pedal backwards and your toes are here and your heel is up here, your heel doesn't do halfway. You're either, your heel's either up off, the, I mean, if you're sitting now and you have your toes on the floor, you can lift your heel up off the floor or you can put your heel back down on the floor. There's really no, middle spot. Your heel's either gonna be off the floor or on the floor. There's nothing else. So now you get a consistent rate of speed. So your needle's going up and down at the constant speed, okay? Now you don't have to even think about your pedal or your speed as far as your sewing machine is concerned anymore because it's always gonna be exactly the same because it can only go as fast as you've set that slider to go, all right? So once that's set, and this is backwards, you won't have to keep it backwards forever because it is a little awkward. Once you get onto it, you'll just naturally do it. But until you do get used to it, I really urge you to turn this pedal backwards. It's gonna make a huge difference in your quilting and your stitch quality. It's gonna be so much better. So once you have this backwards, now all you're gonna have to worry about is moving your hands. So your brain isn't trying to work this and do this at the same time because your brain doesn't have to think about this anymore because it's automatic. Okay, makes sense, right? So now you're gonna be able to be a lot more consistent. I always tell people, <clears throat> you know, yes, this is what you're gonna set it three quarters of the way up. But as you're quilting and you're moving your hands, if you notice your stitches are a little longer than what you would like them to be, push that a little bit more to the right. Make it a little bit more than three quarters, all right? Because the faster you go, the smaller your stitches. The slower you go, the bigger your stitches, okay? So keep that in mind um, as you're quilting because you, you want as consistent as the stitch length as you can get. We don't have stitch regulators, and if you do have a stitch regulator, you can't use it with a ruler foot. It's impossible, because the stitch regulator on a sewing machine, say the Bernina I know has one, 
um, that you can get West Stitch Regular, but it's connected to a foot. So it's pointless because you can't use it with your ruler foot or your rulers. Okay? So that's that. So if anybody has any questions about that, let me know. Okay, attach the foot. When you make your quilt sandwich, I use 505 spray based. There are numerous different kinds. G likes the Salky. Salky makes one. Um, she really likes that one. I bought something years ago that was generic. And boy, oh boy, it gummed up my needle and it was a hot mess. Uh, the 505 doesn't seem to do that. G said the Salky doesn't do that either. Um, but I use the 505 spray based. And what I do is I take my quilt, my quilt, my actual quilt, and I lay it down on the floor pretty side down. Okay. So I have the raw, all the seams up. Then I'll take my batting and I'm going to lay that out on top of my quilt top. All right. So now I've got my backing and my quilt top. And I'm going to spray baste these layers together. But this way I'm able to keep as many of the wrinkles out of the top as possible. And then I'll put spray baste again. And you're going to um, put your backing on. Okay. So the backing is the last part that I see. And I can be sure that there are no wrinkles in here. So when I turn it over, because I've spray basted, but spray baste doesn't really get stuck you know it's sticky but it's temporary and meaning it'll wash out but i can say i flip this over and oh my goodness there's a big old wrinkle across here i can still pull this off i can fix my wrinkle and i can put it back down and it will still stick okay and I don't have to worry about reapplying, you know, the spray or anything like that. It'll still stick and I still get a very nice result because I was able to, because I flipped this over, I already know that my back has no wrinkles in it. All right. <clears throat> so 505, because when you pin baste, you just have to, it, it just takes you so long to do it. One and two. You have to remove every single pin before you put your template in that space. So you're just constantly stopping and starting and stopping and starting, which means it's really hard to get, you know, a nice smooth flow um, that way. So I don't pin based at all. I don't know that you pin based either. Do you, G? Nope. Nope. She doesn't either. Um, so... And I want you to, when you're starting to quilt with templates, for goodness sakes, do not start with a king size quilt. Like I did. I did too. <laughs> I did too. Oh yeah, let's make a quilt. So I pick, of course, and make it the biggest darn quilt ever. Yeah, don't do that. Fat quarters. Nothing bigger than a fat quarter. Okay, to start. Because it's more to fight with. And that's why these mini templates are perfect because you don't have to fight so much with it. So um, fat quarters, and generally speaking, normally when you get a beginner set, because that's what I usually tell people to start with, I always say start with the clouds. And the reason I say that is because your brain works in pattern way better and faster than it works in random, okay? And a stippler or a meander is random. There's no rhyme or reason to it. It's just squiggly lines all over the place. This, very similar to a meander or a stipple, but you do have a distinct pattern. You have four bumps up here. And then on the bottom side, you have four bumps as well. When you get to the end, I always tell everybody to stop in the needle down position and spin your template 180 degrees then you're gonna stitch again again you're gonna have four bumps on the top side four bumps on the bottom side spin your template okay you're gonna want to fill probably two fat quarters or so at least it's 
gonna take you 45 minutes or an hour for the light bulb to come on and you say, <coughs> duh, this is easy. Why was I making it so hard? Because we overthink everything. It's the name of our game, that's what we do. So when you're using this template in particular, because it's a pattern, you don't have to think about it nearly as much because it's gonna be the same no matter what you do. The other thing that is really nice is when you're using any of our path tools, so any of our path easy templates, so like the ones that have this little groove that your foot, the foot actually sits in that space. There is, I mean, there is a smidge, a tiny little smidge of wiggle room there. And because of that, and because the foot, the base of the foot is perfectly round, your stitch line is always in the center of that groove. So it doesn't matter because people always want to know, oh, do I stay to the inside edge or do I stay to the outside edge? It doesn't matter because you're always going to be in the middle, no matter what you do. So it doesn't matter if you hug the inside, you hug the outside. It makes no difference. The, the minute amount of wiggle room that you have there, you'll never, ever in a million years see it you know, whether you stick to the inside or the outside. So, you know, don't, don't consume yourself with worrying about, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm doing this wrong or there is no wrong. You can go forwards or backwards. That's pretty much it. You can go frontwards or backwards. There's nowhere else for you to go, but you're stuck in that groove. So that is how that is. Um, I'm looking for my list again because I want to make sure I cover all these things. Um, and I'll tell you at the end about how to quilt something that is a little bit larger. Um, nesting, which we'll go over. Okay, perfect. All right, so now we're going to quilt. Does anybody have any questions before we quilt? I'm going to say no. You're going to say no? Okay. Nope. There's somebody. Sure. Absolutely. That's a great and, um, idea. Yeah, that's a great idea. Okay. Alrighty. So, okay. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start here. My foot's going to go down inside the groove. I'm going to go ahead and needle down, needle up. So I can pull that bobbin thread up to the top. And I generally am not um, burying my knots. Uh, you can if you want. But typically, I'm quilting something for my kids or my grandbaby, and listen, they don't give a hoot in Hades whether or not I buried the knot. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and just trim those threads out of the way, because I have literally sewn my quilting foot to my fabric before. Um, and I, I want you to pay close attention when we are beginning to stitch. Try really hard, and it's very hard. You'll become more used to it over time, but try really hard not to just push down so hard in the corners because that's what we typically do. You know, we, we kind of get a death grip on the template and we push down extremely hard. And if you can see that flexing of the template, if you get too much of that, now the clouds don't do it as much as, say, the meander does. Um, but if you get too much flex, a lot of times it raises up the center part of the template and then it catches on the back side of the foot. And if it catches on the back side of the foot, it feels as though you're stuck. It feels like the groove isn't wide enough and your foot is stuck in that space. Okay. And well, you can't move if you're stuck, right? So you reef and yank and push, and I've had people accidentally break templates. You know, it happens. I've, I've broken, broken them myself, 
especially by dropping them. Um, but, you know, it, it does happen. But do a little back stitch here at the beginning and try really hard to keep your hand pressure to a minimum, okay? You want it to be enough that this template is your steering wheel. And I'm just gonna grab another tool really quickly. So say for instance, this tool, this tool, it doesn't matter which, but I, because I've waxed my surface, I wanna be able to literally one finger on the template, I should be able to move this. Oops. This is a fat quarter. So I should be able to move that fat quarter with one finger and have it slide easily. If I have to push down like this, first of all, it's harder. Second, I, I shouldn't have to do that. If you do, you need to raise your presser foot up some. You need to do, you know, you need to figure out why you're having to push so hard. Did you wax your surface? Is it slippery? Um, you know, any of those things that are going to prevent you from having that nice flow. All right. So now that I've got this, we're going to go ahead and I'm going to stitch. So I'm just holding on to the template and very gently I'm moving along. Now I know that I'm moving quite quickly um, and that's okay because this is the speed for me. I've done this before. I'm used to doing it. So I'm at the end here. I stop needle down. Now another thing, and I didn't remember to mention this the other day, when you are stopping needle down, I always stop needle down because I don't want to lose my spot, right? So I always stop needle down. But when your needle is in the down position, don't try to lift your foot because you're going to ram it into this uh, needle bar right here and you may damage or break your foot by doing that. Same thing on the way down. If your foot, if your foot is up, don't try to put your needle down because it's going to run that needle bar right into the foot itself, all right? And it's not going to go down into the quilt and you're going to look at yourself and say, why isn't this working? Why isn't this working? Well, it went as far as it can, all right? So now that I'm stopped here at the end, I'm going to go ahead and turn this 180 degrees, all right? Now, people always want to know how do we know if we are going in a straight line. You'll find out that I'm a lazy quilter. I do not want to mark my quilt all up because first of all, it takes a lot of time. Second, I can't sew on the line anyway. So in my opinion, there's not a lot of point in making a line if, if you plan on sewing on it because chances are I'm not gonna stay on the line anyway. It's kind of like stitching in the ditch. Yeah, not gonna happen. So I always use the seams in a quilt. So even say, for instance, I had a seam that ran across up here, I can still use because the start and end of that template are always exactly horizontal from each other. And there's even a line etched on that tool that will um, let you know that, you know, that that's straight. So I could use that and say, okay, even though my seams clear up here, I can say, all right, this is about four inches from this end. And yes, it looks about the same from the other end. And that's how I keep be sure that I'm going in a straight line, relatively straight, um, because I'm not going to put all these registration marks clear across my quilt. I'm just not gonna do it. Um, so now we're gonna go ahead and stop. We turn the template and we're ready to begin again. So I'm gonna do this a second time. Notice how my machine, it isn't going any faster or slower the whole time. And that's really the key. Now I went ahead and spun this. Now I want you to look at the stitches here. See how my stitches are really relatively similar in length. All right, it's not a big one, a short one, a long one. You know, there's not a whole bunch of them uh, piled in on top of each other. I really, it's pretty, pretty close. 
um, to the same. And now I'm gonna go ahead and just tip this so I can see the back. So now I have a purple bobbin in. So you can see how nice the tension looks. If, if Dave and G can get in close here, um, you'll see there is no pin pricks. There is no pin pricks of pink um, yeah. poking up. There is absolutely none. I can't. And so that means that I have perfect. Can you see now, G? No, it's, I can't find it. Oh, there it is. There she found it. She's not. She's not been a cameraman before, <laughs> or a man ever. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so. It's not this week. Um, but yeah, so no pokey. So it's always good to check occasionally because once in a while maybe you'll have a bobbin that doesn't wind quite right. Um, you know, and it doesn't have that constant uh, pressure. Um, but I'm going to do one more, and then I'm going to show you how these nest. And nesting is really a long arming term. Um, if you are familiar with the paper pantographs, um, those are designed to nest, or even the computerized long arms nowadays. Um, those designs nest, you know, it'll have a repeat of, you know, 10 inches or 12 inches or however far, you know, they have to move down, you know, that many times or whatever. Um, same thing here, because this is basically a pantograph, but for your home sewing machine. Okay, and you're just doing one repeat at a time. So I'm going to go ahead and stitch this one more time. And notice when I'm holding my template. See, the middle isn't popping up. Remember I showed you at the very beginning how if I push down really hard, a little back stitch at the end because I'm not going to bury those thread. But if I push down really hard, see that flex? We don't want that. So you can always tell when I'm stitching um, that I'm really not pushing overly hard because otherwise I'd have the middle part there popping up and then, you know, that causes problems. So I'm going to go ahead and cut my thread and now you can see how nice that looks. <clears throat> and the next row, so we are quilting in rows, but because we are nesting the designs, it doesn't look like it's done in rows. So if you are trying to do this and you accidentally, especially when you first start and, and you're not used to nesting, um, you may end up with a gap uh, that kind of runs between the two patterns. And because of what we're gonna do and exactly what I'm gonna show you, it should help you figure out that nesting process. All right, so when I'm nesting, basically what that means is that this pattern needs to poke up into this space here, all right? And it's a lot easier for me to show you when I have two sides versus trying to do it from over here where I've only got one, all right? So I'm gonna slide this up and you'll hear me say on, on videos and different things that I'm gonna line up the outside edge. So this part out here, I'm gonna line up with the stitch line to the row above it. So I'm gonna grab a pen so I can kind of show you. So notice how right here and right here, the outside edge of this uh, template is right over top of the stitch line of that pattern up above, which means because my foot is gonna keep my needle in the center of this path, means that I'm not gonna overlap those stitches. I'm not gonna cross over them they're not gonna touch. So I'm gonna be safe and keeping it where it is. Now, how do I get this one lined up? Because I don't have two spots there. This is what I do. So you're gonna slide this under. I'm gonna put my foot down and my needle down it at this end here. Now I'm gonna turn this backwards. Now it lines up with this spot right here. So I've got the edge of my template and the um, stitch line right underneath of it. So I can just raise my needle, raise my foot. I can go ahead over here, put my foot back down in that spot and I'm ready to go. I'm lined up. So now I don't have to line up again. It's only this one time for the whole row, all right? So I'm gonna go ahead and you would wanna, of course, pull your bobbin up to the top 
and I'm going to do a couple little stitches back and forward. And now I'm just going to stitch. And when I get over here, you're going to see how cool this nets. So every time I spin for the 180 degrees, okay, like right now, or stop needle down, I'm going to turn 180. All I'm looking to do is be sure that as I'm doing it, that this is lined up to the stitch line underneath. Same thing over here. And now I'm ready to go. I don't have to measure anything. And I can just keep on trucking. So I'm going to do this again all the way across the entire quilt. One row at a time. But you'll see how it nests so nicely. And no one ever notices because I've nested it correctly that I've stitched it in rows. It really looks like I quilted this as an all over design. My favorite thing to say is people think I know what I'm doing. So, do you see how these poke up in these spaces? See how nice that looks? If you didn't see the ends here where the start and stop was, and this was just a quilt, you would assume that it was an all over meander type quilting. Um, it looks good and people, like I said, I, I'm not embarrassed anymore. I used to be embarrassed. You know, I'd stitch a handbag or something, you know, the fabric for it and it would look so bad and I'd have them long stitches. Now, if you don't know, my husband's a long armor, all right? And he does beautiful, gorgeous quilting without thinking about it. He can just do it. It just flows out of him. He's an award-winning long armor. He's amazing. <laughs> he has all of those things. But regardless, he's like, here, you." he taught me how to load a quilt. I can do that. I've watched him do class after class after class. Yeah, no, I can't run that thing. I cannot. It is my, it looks awful. So this is for me. This is my speed. I'm comfortable with my own sewing machine. I'm not comfortable with that long arm. You know, this, this is for me. Um, and besides, you know, most of the things that I make are, you know, lap throws, crib quilts, table runners. They're to be used. They're not to be awarded or yeah. judged. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm using them and they're not huge. Not that I'm not saying that you can't do a big quilt because you can, but chances are you're going to do a lot more lap size, twin size, maybe, and smaller. A lot of people say, you know, I'm still going to send that king size quilt that I do once a year out to somebody to have quilted because I'm not going to wrestle with it. But this solves a lot of problems. So if anybody has any questions about the clouds, let me know. Um, but otherwise, oh, we, oh, we got... I love the cloud too. It it just looks nice on everything. It does. You know, it doesn't matter if it's for a guy or for a gal. It looks good anyway. Yeah. And mine always just look like rows. And so now I kind of know how to make it look all over. So I appreciate that. Absolutely. Now, all of our Path Easy tools. So the ones that are like this, the meander, the, the clouds, the swirl, you know, there's a whole bunch of them. Any of them, they all nest exactly the same. So you're always going to be looking for the same few features. And there's a YouTube video too. If you get, you know, if you need a refresher, you can go to YouTube and watch a video on how to do it as well. Okay. So same thing here with our meander. Yes, Dave? So a young lady named Jolene just joined the class. Hi, yes. Jolene. How are you? We're glad you made it. Well, more importantly, you need to remind everybody that this is going to, the complete lesson is going to be posted to YouTube. Yes. So they can go back and see it anytime they want. But G is the cameraman on that video, <laughs> so you, you might get a little jiggling. It's a good thing I don't have to hold the camera because my head shakes, so everything would be shaking. <laughs> <laughs> well... 
and she's never been a man before today. So, you know, since she's the camera man today. I'm the camera queen. <laughs> <laughs> she's never been a guy before. So, anyways, uh, Jolene, feel free to, if you have a question, just let us know. Um, but I'm going to move on now to the meander. Now, most of us. And this was the first template that I designed, but I designed it in the big size because I was, I designed the big foot first because I designed it after my husband's long arm foot. Because I thought, boy, if I, if I could just have something, a guide, I could maybe do this for myself. So I came home from a quilt show anyhow, and uh, my, my father owns a machine shop. And I said, Dad... I took my husband's long arm foot to the shop and I said, Dad, do you think you could make me a foot that looked like this to fit on this? First, he wanted to fix my sewing machine. I told him not to tear it apart. It was okay. <laughs> and needless to say, a uh, few days later, I had a foot. Yes. You need to tell Jolene to touch the microphone icon on her screen. Jolene, touch the microphone icon on your screen. <laughs> to turn off your mic. To turn your mic off. That way we don't hear your background noise. Not that we don't like your laugh. <laughs> yeah, everybody has... It's on the actual screen that you're looking at. If you touch your picture, four icons come up. One's a link. I had some One's water. something else. One is a uh, okay. picture of a microphone. And if you just touch it, you can turn your mic off. Thank and then you. if you have a question, you just turn your mic back on. Do you and see it? Okay, if you it's can't figure it out, try not to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> you can laugh. She may be on a computer, not on a device. I'll tell you how I'm going to laugh like I did last night. It took me watching the 2017 tutorial from you guys to know to tear the blue paper off the template that I bought. We're here for you, man. <laughs> Hey, We're glad we could be entertaining. You're not the only one who's done that. There's actually been a lot. It's a little bit important. Anyways, so on the meander, most of us, you know, our friend, we may have a, a friend or possibly two that says, hey, you can do, you can meander. Everybody can meander. It's easy. It is. So, no, it's not easy for me. I don't do random well. And so because of that, of course, my very first template that I wanted to design was a meander because, well, I can't do it or can't do it well enough to make myself happy. Um, so same thing is going to apply with the meander that the start and the finish are exactly across from one another. Um, so you can use the ends as a guide. Um, with a seam in your quilt and know whether or not you're going uphill or downhill instead of having to mark all over your quilt. Um, if you were able to use a uh, a seam and maybe it hits just about just right, or if you decide you want to mark lines across your quilt, you can. Um, but you're just going to make sure that the start and the finish are always on that line. That way you're always going in a straight line and you never have to worry whether or not you're quilting uphill or downhill. Um, I learned that the hard way. It's never good when you get halfway through a quilt and all of a sudden you realize that your quilt, your stitching is going like this and you say, oh crap. Going, going, show them again because, wait a minute, wait, oh, they're, can't yeah. get it. Hold on. <laughs> I'm having a, I'm She's having a camera issue. Okay, she, show me again. She never used that thing because it's like a joystick on a game. Well, yeah, but she went so fast. Go ahead. Oh, I was... Yeah, because I do a lot of really fast stuff. Yeah, <laughs> you're just speedy guns all I let me tell you. <laughs> anyway, so one of the very first quilts I quilted, of course, I was, you know, I'd never done it. So anyways, my quilt in when I was about halfway through was was going uphill. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so it wasn't a good, it wasn't a very good look and it was a lot to rip out to fix it. So I didn't rip it out, of course, because... So did you go with that slant through the whole quilt after that? Okay. I just I just kept, kept kept on trucking. And nobody would notice after it's all done. Well, if you looked at the top row and you looked at the last row, <laughs> it was a little obvious. But, you know, 
they you give them to people who don't quilt anyway, so yeah, you know they don't know. And we are our own worst critics. That's we for are. Sure. We yeah. are. So anyway, so we're gonna start with this. Now this one is, if anything, if any template in the world is gonna give you a bad time, it will be this one. It will make you curse, cry, scream, yell, stomp your feet, all of those things, um, because it is. It it really truly could be your own personal hell. Um, because it's, it does, it's not nice. It's not very friendly. Um, so I'm going to start at one end, like I did the last time. So I'm going to go ahead and slide that under. You're going to pull your bobbin thread up to the top and you're always going to do this. So you don't get that thread nest on the back, right? So when I hold on to this, there isn't a lot of extra meat around the outside edge of this template. Um, so of course you naturally don't want to run your fingers over. So you're, you're holding on to the outside. But when you hold on to the outside of this template, see how awful the flex is? I mean, it's really quite bad. So by the time, if I'm stitching this, I get up into this area, it's raised it enough that it won't slide underneath the back, the template won't slide underneath the back of the template or the back of the foot. See how that template or that foot kind of is just sits uh, underneath that, the back side of that foot. And when, you, when you're doing this, well, that raises this up too high and then it catches. And it feels like the path is too narrow and that your foot is stuck in that little groove, which isn't really so. It's really not stuck. The whole problem is, is because this is popped up. So what you're going to want to do <laughs> is... Move your fingers. You're always going to want to move your fingers. So I'm going to keep my index finger out here because this little peninsula is only held on by this little bit of uh, acrylic back here. All right. So as I come out here, I'm going to get more and more flex as I'm pushing against this template. Right. So index finger is going to go out there and I'm going to stitch. So this one takes a little bit more practice. That's why it's always number two. And it's random. So as I come around here, I'm gonna take my index finger from the other hand and it's gonna come up here like this and I'm gonna continue. This way I'm holding down that um, template. Now, because I'm I'm gonna come out to this side, so now I'm gonna come in behind and I'm just, I'm just gonna walk that finger up that peninsula. And as I come around, the other index finger comes in behind. And you'll get used to this. You'll come to a spot where it just becomes really very natural for you, but it's going to take some practice. It is. And this one's going to take you longer to master than this one. It's going to, this one's going to take you longer to master than this one. And this one you're backtracking on. But because of these peninsulas and because of that flex and because you're new, you're not used to it. And so you're going to naturally push harder on the template than what you really need to push. Okay. You will stop doing it eventually, but it's going to take some getting used to. So just try to keep in the back of your head the whole time, you know, that you want to be gentle. You don't have to push hard um, because really pushing hard, you're making it harder on yourself. The other thing that happens is when we are holding on to this template, you know, no matter if it's the, the meander or if it's whatever template, it doesn't make any difference. And you're pushing um, down too hard. This is what you this is what you look like, okay? So you're holding on and you're pushing down really hard, and your shoulders go up like this, right? And pretty soon you're going like this, and you're trying your whole body is moving with this quilt. Well, can you imagine how bad that's going to hurt tomorrow? <laughs> Trust me, it's going to hurt because you're so tense. And if your shoulders go up like this, you need to stop, back away from the quilt, relax, because you're not going to be happy with the job you're going to do because okay. you're so tense. A glass of wine really does help. Or two. Or maybe a bottle. Well, by Whatever. Then, you're not going to care. That's it. That's <laughs> it. That's it. You don't care. So now we're going to start again. Now, so I've, I've come to the end. I've stopped needle down. I'm going to go ahead and turn 180 degrees. 
and I'm going to continue. So again, I'm going to move my fingers back and forth all the way around. And I would do this all the way across the quilt surface. So however big that quilt is, whether it's a, a cable runner or a king size quilt, I'm going to do this all the way across. All right, so now we're at the end. Again, you're gonna stop, you're gonna turn, and you can see what the stipple looks like. So it looks, it looks nice. Um, and everything's gonna be exactly the same as it was up here. You're gonna slide the template down to nest, um, all of those things. I'm not a huge fan of stippling. I mean, you see it everywhere. Every quilt known to man has a stipple on it, I swear. Um, and so over time, I've gotten sick of it. Um, so what I've discovered is not only does this do a great job, and because Lord knows I can't stipple like this at all in real life, without a template anyway, um, I've discovered that I can use these Path Easy tools to do um, more like a kind of an echo uh, quilting, which is kind of fun. And so I like the stipple when I do um, this. And my husband actually does it on a long arm and he calls it ribbons. So what I'm gonna do, my foot's still in that path, and all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do two or three little stitches down and I'm gonna move that foot down about, and the whole template's gonna move. It's gonna be about a quarter of an inch-ish. You know, I'm not really measuring, I'm just guessing. And then I'm gonna stitch, but I'm gonna go backwards, all right? You don't wanna go backwards on your first one. You're gonna wanna go backwards a little later, once you kind of get how the template works. Um, but it really is a cool design. And I like it so much more. So this is typically what I do with my meander template um, because I like the way it looks. So isn't that a cool ribbon? And all I did was slide the template a quarter of an inch. So there's your regular and there's your ribbon. Isn't that cool? It looks nice. It's a completely different look. Great for baby quilts, uh, wedding quilts. Um, anything like that. So it looks really good and it's something different. You know, there isn't a template, at least not that I have, that does that without just doing that simple three or four stitches, slide it down a quarter of an inch and quilt. So much, much nicer. Okay, so now if I was gonna nest this, this particular template, and I wanna show you this quickly, um, Somebody has a question? Uh, sure, go ahead. I have a question about the ribbing. Ribbing? You went down, you went through, and then you went backwards. Yep. Okay? So now you're at the starting point. What if you want to do a whole row of these? You're going to just flip the whole template. So, let's see. Oh, so you do a row of ribbon, of ribbon and then turn it around and go back over your row again? Yep. Yep, you're gonna do the whole row of meander all the way clear to the end. When you get to the end, you're just gonna scoot your template down a quarter of an inch and you're gonna quilt it backwards. Okay. And you. that way you're never breaking your thread. You know, we want as little thread breaks as we have to have. So, you know, as if we can make it in a continuous line, that's the best route. You know, you have a lot less chances of your stitching coming out and everything else. So it works really nicely. Thank you. Absolutely. Any other questions? Um, maybe it's just my computer, but my picture is blurry of everything. Does everybody else see it clearly? Oh. Shh. Nobody's chiming in. Well, I see it clearly. I see. Uh, okay. One no. person who shook their head no. So okay. it could be your auto No. Computer. It's the it's the computer. It's the speed of the connection. The good news is is that the camera that we're using for the YouTube video is uh -huh. has a lot better close ups, a lot better angle, and will be easier for you to understand what's going on. So when you get a chance, you can watch that at your leisure. You can take it in little chunks 
You don't have to watch all two hours at one time. Or you can watch it nine million times if you want to. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. So, Thank but you. that we're posting to the Stephen G's YouTube, YouTube channel. Okay. So, and, and also the Farrell's YouTube channel, probably, right? No. Nope. Oh no, just Stephen just G. Stephen G. Just okay. Stephen G. Yeah, this is a Stephen G. You're gonna get a link to the to the to the video. I was looking for my fancy. Oh, it was here earlier. I know. Well, somewhere, oh. my fancy email address. Oh, you can show them up there. No, those aren't email addresses. Well, those are websites. I know, but what if they go there, they can get our email address and they can send us um, an email if they have any questions or problems or anything like that. But also, um, they can find us on YouTube or Facebook by going to Farrell's Country Stitching. No, I don't have the Stephen G show. I was going to say, you have more room up there for yellow pieces of paper. You got. I guess I need to make a new yeah, sign. Yeah. So our YouTube channel is Steph and the Amphoran sign G show. And G is G-E-E. -E. Yes. Like in golly darn G whiz. <laughs> okay, now before I move on to the swirls, I want to show you just quickly how this particular one nests. Um, you can see how I've lined this up. So I'm right back to where I would have been had I just stitched this. And then you're going to take this and you're going to slide it directly below. And what, again, what you're looking for is lining up, um, with that stitch line above. So I'm getting a spot here where the outside edge of my cutout is lined up with the stitch line there. And this here is going to fit up into this little, this little space right here, okay? And this is what I mean. So on this Facebook room thing, I can't zoom in, I can't get super up close or super close ups. And on the camera that G's running, the picture you would be seeing right now is about, looks like it's about two inches away from the template. So it gives you really great detail. So so what you're looking for right here is, is you've got the stitch line right underneath the edge here and the same right here, all right? And then you're gonna stitch that again, but that's gonna get you that really nice nesting, all right? So that's how the, the meander nests. Okay, now, Believe it or not, the swirl, which actually isn't part of the beginner set, but so many times I sell this actually, you know, at a show, if I'm doing a show, a lot of people will buy, if they're going to buy any extra templates besides just the beginner set, they'll buy this. So this is our mini swirl. It is actually my very favorite template. I love this template and I've had it out for quite some time and I, I love it the same today as I loved it four years ago. Um, it's just really pretty. And like the clouds, it looks good on nearly everything. Um, and I, it's just really nice. And I, it's actually our best seller. We sell this um, in all the sizes. So not just the mini, but we have it in the mini XL and the um, classic size and even for long arm. We sell this template more than any of the other templates. It's it's just really pretty. And making curls, if you've ever tried to do it consistently, is not an easy task. It's really not. So um, all the same things apply with this template as with the others. You've still got your start and stop exactly horizontal from one another. Um, the foot's going to fit right in that path. You're going to have a smidge of wiggle room. Um, people always want to know, you know, hug the inside, hug the outside. It doesn't make any difference. Um, but when you're going to start with this guy, of course, we're going to pull the bobbin thread just like we did on all the others. And we're going to do a little backwards forwards. People are always very concerned about this because there's no way to do this design without Back backtracking. And, you know, if you're like me, when I first started quilting, I was told over and over and over, probably 80 million times, well, you shouldn't stitch out. <laughs> I don't feel so bad anymore. <laughs> a little earthquake here in Pennsylvania. <laughs> Anyways, um, I was always told, you know, you shouldn't, 
your threads shouldn't cross over each other. You know, you shouldn't touch that line with this line. Isn't that just stippling? Well, listen, I don't know. Oh. I didn't, remember, I didn't quilt until I'd been, like, owning a shop and everything else for 10 years before I started You didn't this. start quilting until you got old. I, that's correct. Okay. I mean, I started piecing way younger. Um, but quilting, no, not so much. Um, anyway, so um, what we're going to do is, and this is one of the times where I'm going to say, and it naturally happens. It's not like I necessarily pay a bunch of attention to it, but you kind of naturally always hug the inside edge. Pretty much. It's it's weird, but it's true. Centripetal force. So a little backwards, forwards, and we're going to go ahead and stitch. So I am actually up against the inside edge of that first swirl. And I'm going all the way in and then all the way back out. As I come back out, I'm going to go a little further than just right here. I'm not going to just hit here and then zoom off to the to the next swirl. I'm going to actually go up so that I can pick up touching the inside so I'm on the inside of this swirl. Okay? So whichever edge you choose, stick with it. That's it. Yeah. Or you're not going to backtrack. You'll get an echo. And it, not that the echo looks bad. It doesn't. But some people are a lot more fussy than other people. And for me, I just wing it and, you know, it's good enough for me. Um... But some people, it's, that's not okay with them. And, and that's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I just know for me that I am so far from perfect that, you know, why bother? I mean, really. Well, you are bothering, though. Yeah. <laughs> well, I am for this demo, but I mean, because I want people to know. But if I'm doing my own thing... Look how pretty that is. So it does look really nice. But you can see I slid my template, just a freckle right there. Even though I was hugging the edge, see I've got the double line. It doesn't look bad. It really doesn't. Long armors backtrack all the time. All the time. Because they are not cutting their thread unless they're at the end of the row. Or they've run out of quilt, quilt, something. Run bobbin out of bobbin. Thread. Yeah, bobbin thread is the big They one. are not cutting the thread. They're yeah. not. Um, you know, they've figured out how to not back themselves into corners. Um, but this tool does, is another one, it, it really does nest very, very nicely. Um, so as I'm going, I'm going to just keep on trucking. But if you push too hard on this one, you'll notice, especially in that middle swirl, you may notice that um, you're getting a little bit of lift. So just keep that in mind. If you get in here and you say, oh, geez. I'm stuck, just push down in the center of that space. It's just because you're pushing a little bit too hard on the um, outside. So I'm gonna go ahead and finish this up. And a little back stitch at the end. But again, see, same spot. I really kind of, it must be my spot, I guess. Uh, slid up in both those spots, but it doesn't look bad. I mean, I wouldn't be worried about that at all. On a, on a quilt, you'd never see that. You wouldn't, no. And, I mean, I've listen, I've looked at a lot of show quilts, and I, I've seen plenty of show quilts where their backtracks weren't, 100, weren't on perfectly either. So, um, now, nesting this guy. Um, you're going to want to pay attention to this um, because... The easiest way is always to lay this up above and then scooch it directly below. And this should nest. See how this, it needs to fit up in that space up there. Okay? See how nice it between the sits two curls. up in here? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Between the two curls. And then you're going to be ready to go. You can just start and, and, and take off and quilt this. But it's going to nest so nicely. No one will ever know that you stitched this in a row. The only time you're going to see it when you stitch makes it look like you're stitched in a row is if you come down like this. Too and then hard. see, you're going to get this complete band. band of unquilted fabric, which is what you want to avoid. Um, obviously, you know, fake it till you make it. I'm real good at that. And this works. 
people don't have a clue in the world that you're using templates unless you tell them. And you're telling them generally because you love it, it works wonderful for you, and you're getting more compliments now on your quilt projects because of the way that they're quilted versus stitching in the ditch or doing a crosshatch or something like that, you're, you're getting more compliments, you know? That purse fabric that you've had to quilt because, you know, you wanted this certain fabric. Now it can look really pretty and look like, you know, it'll look like you know what you're doing. Stop, but don't hesitate. You know, you, you're going to have to practice. Normally about once the light bulb starts really clicking, you know, generally about an hour a piece um, until you really get the hang of three or four of them, then, then it's literally 10 minutes you know, for the light bulb to come on and, and you say, okay, I've got it. It's not a, not a problem. I'm going to do it just like I do all the rest of them. Um, but the more you play, the better you get, the smoother you get, the more consistent you get. So don't think it's, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. And because I bought these rulers, I'm never going to have to practice anything. That's just not true. You didn't, it down and sew a quarter inch seam by sight the very first time that you you sewed a quilt but I bet most of you can sit down now and pretty much sew a quarter inch seam and never have to use a quarter inch foot or anything because you're so used to doing it not everybody's like you Steph <laughs> I, but I didn't say that everybody was like me I'm just saying, but a lot of people... They can eyeball a quarter inch. You can yeah. eyeball a quarter inch pretty pretty well. Mm. <laughs> oh, boy. Dave's having an off day. Evening classes are probably not the best thing for Dave. He has having... to have a midday class because that's when he peaks. He, he peaks <laughs> between 10 and 2 in the afternoon. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, 10 so, but too. if you can um, see this, You'll be able to see how nice um, this looks. You'll be able to see it on my video. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> it really is nice. This nests up inside here so nicely. It looks great as an all over quilting design. Um, is it 100% perfect? It depends what perfect is to you, I suppose. Um, but it's pretty darn close for me and it's good enough for me. Um, now I have a question. Sure. My camera's not picking up some of the stitches. They're all there though, right? The stitches are all there. Okay, yeah, because some of it looks like it just skipped them. Oh, I see. If I get closer, you can see that they're in there. Okay. Well, you can't stay six feet away all the time, well, G. Not You've got a big stick. <laughs> <laughs> I carry a big stick, yes. <laughs> Sheesh. Okay. Anyway, so it looks nice. It doesn't take forever, but you do have to practice. You know, spend some time. Just quilt some black fabric like this and make grocery tote bags out of it. You know, take to the grocery store. And, you know, Be that way you're not wasting it. And, you know, you're still, you know, you're not wasting the fabric. The other thing you can do if you're a little nutso about your fabric and you don't want to waste it, if you get water-soluble thread and put it in your bobbin, then you can stitch and stitch and stitch all you want. And then all you have to do is spray it with water. And all you've done out. is use some thread. Yeah. The rest of it, you can, then you can use your fabric over again. Or you can stitch on water-soluble stabilizer and practice your quilting. Yes, <clears throat> absolutely. Make a scarf or a vest. Well, Dee's going to be doing a class on that the coming up. Well, you're going to talk about the thread director on Sunday. Sunday, but we're not going to schedule the class until later in the year, probably. Yes, but anyways, but it's a she'll show you the samples though on Saturday or Sunday. So if you want to join her for her uh, lecture trunk show on Sunday, um, you can email her. And let me give you her email address. It is g g e e at notionsyouneed.com. Um, and just tell her you want to sign up for the class. Um, there's no charge, just like this one. So, you know, but 
you will have to bear with us and all our screw ups and all that stuff. You'll have to, you'll, I'm sorry. But we'll, <laughs> we are improving with each time, hopefully. Not always. Well, this, <laughs> this class went easier than the last one, right? Well, well we don't know how many people are here. Yeah. The last one, it told us. Well. This one, it doesn't. Well, how, whoever's here, we're thankful that you're here and we hope that you're enjoying your class. Um, is there any other questions that I can answer for anybody? Doesn't look like it. Um, let's see. Oh, I was going to tell them how to do a big quilt. quilt. The yes. woman in the green shirt fell asleep at her desk. She did? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. He's outing people. I can't <laughs> believe it. <laughs> oh, I can believe it. So, a um, couple more quick things. Um, the 16th, if you want to take the next class with the templates, um, it's going to be with still the remaining templates that are in your beginner set. So, the Feather Magic, the Flourish, and the Scapula. Scapula. Okay, so those are the three tools that we're going to be using. So we're going to be doing some stuff for sashings in um, narrow borders. We're going to be doing leaves and feathers, obviously. Um, all kinds of vines. It, it's, it's a really fun class. Um, but I want you to get comfortable with this stuff over the next two weeks or a week and a half or however long it is. Um, you know, really spend a little bit of time if you can you know, even if it's 10 minutes a day, just to get familiar um, with the tools and how much pressure you need to use and so on and so forth, um, because it's going to really make your life a lot easier when you get to doing the feathers and stuff. So, and most of us would love to make feathers. Um, so it's not as hard as you think um, because you're using a tool. So you, consistency is really comes really quite quickly um for that so that's that's going to be the 16th so if you want to sign up for that you can email me at uh country stitching at gmail.com and that's how you here i'll go ahead and this is how it's spelled because uh well not that way um i can do this i know i can okay see where it says ferrell's country stitching so it's not ferrell's it's Country stitching at gmail.com. Okay, so stitching is S T I T C H I N, no G on the end. This is my Zoom. <laughs> Your arm isn't long enough. <laughs> Get a piece of paper and write that down because his arm is not long enough. So, <laughs> anyways, so, and there's going to be classes. We have one scheduled for every Sunday, the month of August, as of right this second. Um, and we're doing the same Facebook platform on everyone because we're testing this platform out to see if it's going to be something we want to do permanently with the Facebook rooms or if we're going to switch everything over to a YouTube room. Um, so it's probably going to be, chances are it'll be one of those two platforms. We just aren't sure which one is going to be best for our customer. Um, so let us know your feedback on all that stuff too, because you know, we want to know. Do any of you have that automatic presser foot thing, you know, where the, it lifts and lowers? The Viking has it. They're the ones that invented the technology. Now a lot of machines, companies are yeah, do it. purchasing it from them. Because uh, they own yeah, them. so but you know where you're sewing along, and when you get to a corner or whatever, your presser foot will just lift up off the fabric. Auto pivot. Yeah. So if that is the type of machine you have, you are going to want to go into your settings and shut that off. Um, if you can't shut it off, you want to change the number down to zero so that it stops doing that. Because if it if your foot is coming up off the fabric every time you stop, then you're going to break something. The template at some point is gonna slide underneath that foot and you are gonna break a needle at the very least. You know, so. I'm wondering if we went off the air because everybody looks like they're asleep for the last five minutes. 
Are you kidding me? There's not getting any. I think when the thing went dead. What went dead? <laughs> the gimbal. Are we still on there? I don't know, but join up again. I don't know if that's the way to do it. Shit.